Good afternoon on today's Angry Bulletin. Another day, another $35 million for Blue Origin from NASA and the U.S. taxpayers. What is it about this company that has yet to reach orbit and yet still receives at least as much financial support from the government as SpaceX gets without providing much in the way of tangible results? Is it just because it's less expensive to give Blue Origin a little bit of money here and there as opposed to facing nonstop lawsuits from Jeff Bezos? Or is there something more important, something perhaps beneficial that might come out of this particular award? All of this and more coming at you on The Angry Astronaut right now. Good afternoon and once again, welcome to The Angry Astronaut. So before we get any further into the topic, just want to thank everybody who's been generously contributing to the North American tour that's going to be coming up very, very soon now, kicking off in Orlando and concluding, I believe, in Los Angeles. And we're starting to get dates established for that. I have a special going on either for people who support me on Patreon or people who would like to support me on Patreon, giving you a discounted rate for tickets and a free digital copy of the book to go with it. If you'd like to check any of that out, it's in the description, and that's all we need to say about that. Let's get on to the topic at hand. So one thing that I really like to complain about a lot on this channel is Blue Origin. I pick on them a great deal and I've been asked a number of times why, you know, why is Blue Origin in my crosshairs so much? Well, there are some very important reasons. This company has spent more than two decades trying to get to space. And aside from getting to sub suborbital space, something that a lot of companies have done in a substantially shorter amount of time, well, they really haven't had any other success as far as that's concerned, at least not yet. The new Glenn rocket that we've been hoping to see for about half a decade now still shows no sign of being tested, no sign of a mature rocket emerging from their manufacturing facilities, at least not yet. And in spite of that, they keep getting piles of money from the government. Recently, they received millions of dollars for another project involved with the Artemis program, and you can't help but wonder, why is NASA continuing to do this? Why do they continue to shovel so much money into a company that has so little tangible success to show for it, and why do we as taxpayers have to put up with it? Well, the answer might surprise you because what Blue Origin received money for is something very important, actually, something crucial to the success of the Artemis program. That is to say, if Artemis is intended to put mankind on the moon to stay this time and to build up a robust cis-lunar architecture, and more importantly, a number of other companies received a lot of money as well for equally important projects. So if Blue Origin didn't receive money for the new Glenn from NASA, then what did they receive money for? Well, for a project that a lot of you have probably heard about before called Blue Alchemist. No, not Blue Exorcist, Blue Alchemist. And here's the idea behind it. Indeed, one of the most important things that we might ever do on the moon and something that goes completely side by side with Blue Origin's long-term objectives of exporting heavy industry and other damaging activities off the planet and out into space. The idea behind Blue Alchemist is to simply convert lunar regolith into usable solar cells. Quote, our proprietary transport subsystem moves and separates molten material at temperatures above 1600 degrees in a controlled and power efficient manner while withstanding the high temperature corrosive environment. Molten regolith electrolysis extracts iron, then silicon, then finally aluminum by passing a current through the molten regolith. The rising oxygen bubbles in one of our reactors show metals and metalloids being separated from oxygen. Our reactor geometry, metal extraction approach, and material selection will enable sustained lunar operations. But it's going to do a hell of a lot more than that. Yes, the idea of manufacturing solar cells on the moon is going to 
make it a lot easier to generate power on the moon simply because it takes so much fuel and so much money to transport anything from Earth to the moon. If you can build solar cells on the moon instead, that means you will get the solar cells that you need for a lunar colony without having to invest all that fuel and money. But this breakthrough, which by the way other companies and universities have been working on for years, can produce a lot more benefit for mankind than just generating energy on the moon. But before we get to that, there are a number of other companies that receive substantial awards as well. Astrobotic, for example, received $34.6 million. And by the way, for a smaller company like Astrobotic, this is a huge cast award. They received that money in order to demonstrate a new power power and transmission system on the lunar surface. It's called Luna Grid Light, and this particular award was to fund the demonstration of robotic deployment of a one kilometer length of cable and power transmission through that cable across the lunar surface. A cube rover delivered by Astrobotics Griffin Lander will deploy the power line. The demonstration will advance power generation and distribution technologies, including a high voltage power converter, cable, and cable reel system. Astrobotic CEO John Thornton said in a statement, quote, Luna Grid Light will pave the way for power generation and distribution services on the moon and change the game for lunar surface systems like landers, rovers, habitats, science suits, and in-situ resource utilization pilot plants. With renewable, uninterrupted commercial power service, both crude and robotic operations can be made sustainable for long-term operations. Astrobotic is hyper-focused on delivering all sorts of payloads to the moon, and most of these are intended as a precursor to building a long-term presence on the lunar surface. But in my opinion, one of the most exciting developments that got some funding this time, and the one that didn't get a whole lot of news coverage, was United Launch Alliance and the hypersonic inflatable aerodynamic decelerator, previously known as the Lofted. But the Lofted was a test article and it worked. It worked brilliantly. So the objective is to build a lofted that's double the size of the original test article in order to be able to deliver even larger payloads from orbit through our atmosphere without having them burn up. This is a far less expensive and practical heat shield than the ones that we have used in the past and will allow a variety of different payloads to be delivered from space. But how is that important to what's going on on the moon? Seems to me that this was a $25 million award just to help ULA develop their smart reusability program in order to reuse their BE-4 engines on the Vulcan Centaur. Well, that's not the case at all. With a system like this, you can dispatch very large payloads from the moon and have them delivered to Earth for a minimal cost. Let me give you an example as to why this is so important. Let's say that you're mining extremely valuable materials on the moon. Let's say lithium, for example, and you were to use this system in order to deliver it to Earth. You could deliver up to 40 metric tons of lithium in a single launch and do it with a lot less fuel as well, considering the fact that the moon only has one-sixth the gravity that Earth does. Utilizing this technology together with some very modest capability rockets, you could set up an entire cis-lunar infrastructure that delivers valuable rare earths and metals that require very destructive mining on Earth and also child labor in Africa, by the way, as well. And you can do all of these things in space without having to damage the environment and making a substantial amount of money at the same time. And this sort of technology would make all of this possible. And so this is what I mean when I'm talking about a cis-lunar industry or a cis-lunar architecture. It enables us to export the damaging things that we do on this planet, mining being one of the most important things that we're talking about here, that's incredibly damaging, but also power generation and the amount of CO2 and other greenhouse gases that we need to pump into the environment in order to make all of that possible. Well, a cis-lunar architecture would allow us to maintain our civilization without damaging the Earth, and renewable energy only goes so far, because in order to build all of these 
things, solar farms, wind farms, etc. All of that requires a great deal of mining, a great deal of greenhouse gas being put into the environment in order to manufacture and transport these things. If you can build all of that in space, it not only is a lot more efficient, solar panels are eight times as efficient in space as they are on Earth, but it also allows you to do it in a far less damaging manner. And something like Lofted allows you to deliver enormous amounts of payload, enormous amounts of ore, for example, from the moon without having to damage anything. What you're looking at right now is a solar power station, as envisioned by the European Space Agency and also the UK Space Agency called Project Cassiopeia. The objective right now is to build these power stations not only in Earth orbit, but also at an Earth-Moon Lagrange point, approximately 61,350 kilometers from the lunar surface. In theory, this power station could transmit energy not only to the moon, but also back to Earth via microwaves, 23 megawatts worth of energy, at least for the small-scale satellites, ultimately being scaled up to several gigawatts. This means that if Jeff Bezos can manufacture solar cells in huge quantities on the lunar surface, he can become a utility company if he collaborates with ESA and with the UK Space Agency or with other companies that want to build these solar power stations. And he can become a utility without damaging the environment, which is a very popular thing to do these days. And this is what Jeff Bezos has talked about all along as being the long-term goal of Blue Origin, to export damaging things, especially if we're talking about power generation, from the Earth and putting it out into space where it's not going to do any harm. By the way, if you want to learn more about this power station, it's a pretty exciting concept from ESA. The idea also includes that they would like to make this into a manned power station that would be a tourist destination amongst other things. Things. Definitely an ambitious long-term program, but one that could be made possible with Jeff Bezos's enormous resources. Well, last year I conducted an interview with an engineer who's heading up this program in the UK, and I have a link to that interview at the end of this video. I definitely advise that you check it out because she had some amazing information to share. So this is really what NASA is looking to do in the long run on the moon, not only go to the moon to stay, but also to exploit the resources that the moon has at its disposal in order to alleviate the problems we have here on Earth, in order to feed the growing energy and resource needs of our civilization, and to do it without damaging anything on our precious planet. And many of the other companies that received awards under this tipping point program, as it is called, are also working towards this objective. Lockheed Martin, for example, was demonstrating in-space components, joining and inspection technologies for structural, electrical, and fluid systems that allows them to conduct in-space assembly architectures. In other words, build space stations a lot more easily. You have Redwire, which develop, is developing a greater, compactor, and microwave emitter that will allow them to build artificial landing pads on the moon out of lunar regolith that'll make it way easier to set down on the surface of the moon with a massive ship like Starship. By the way, the red wire system is designed to use in situ materials in order to build things like foundations, roads, habitats, even habitat furnishings could be built by this system. Amazing stuff coming from a wide variety of companies that will help Help us not only stay on the moon to stay, but also exploit the moon for the benefit of mankind back here on Earth. This is one of the main things that I talk about in my book, How Starship Will Save the World. Also, I released a video not that long ago about how Starship will reverse climate change. If you haven't seen that, it's also linked at the end of this video. So the long and the short of it is, if Blue Origin manages to do what they say they're going to do, if they can exploit the resources of the moon in order to make things better for mankind on Earth, well, the money that NASA just invested is well worth it. Indeed, the money that NASA invested in the Blue Moon Lander is also worth it. 
But before we get too excited about any of this, Blue Origin has to make it to orbit, and I don't have the highest hopes about that happening anytime soon. Please smash that like, hit that subscribe, it's extremely important to the success of this channel, and also once again check the description for various ways to support this content, and as always, stay angry about space!